Hello, my name is Chris Roberts. Welcome to The Long Road. I'm here with Wayne Woolrich, the Assistant Superintendent of SAU for the Towns. Hello, how are you? Pretty good. How long have you been the Assistant Superintendent for the Towns? Uh, since November 2002. So I've had uh, a number of years of experience with uh, six towns that surround Keene, uh, Chesterfield, West Milan, Marlowe, Nelson, Harrisville, and Marlboro. And I work with uh, Keene as well. And um, I heard that you're getting ready to retire? Well, I have a uh, potential of uh, three years um, in New Hampshire that uh, I'd like to you know, work through that uh, remaining three years. I came from Western Montana, from Missoula, Montana in 1990 as an administrator at Keene High School, assistant principal, eventually uh, served as a principal there and a principal at Jonathan Daniels and now an assistant superintendent for the towns. Um, had a great career in Keene. Uh, I came thinking I'd stay a year or two, and once I arrived, uh, and couldn't imagine a better place to raise children, to have children in schools, to it, really look at the wonderful recreational opportunities and the cultural opportunities in the area. So I came uh, based on a Chamber of Commerce uh, uh, with Ed Burke, uh, Fred Parcells at Central Square, talking about what a beautiful community Keene was, hadn't been to to New England, uh, flew out, uh, did an interview uh, at Keene High School, and I've been here since. I've enjoyed every year, and uh, it's been a wonderful experience. I couldn't, couldn't be happier. You know that I'm bo I was born in Wyoming, and I still go back. I'm planning on going back this summer. It's just something about that area, Montana, Wyoming, Idaho. Big country. Yeah. People are great. But it's quite different from Keene. Yeah. Both of them had their bennies. Yeah, I found a lot of similarities as well as, as differences. It's been wonderful, great contrast. And hopefully you'll take all your three years because we'll miss you if you leave earlier. We'll still miss you if you leave after three years. Thank you very much. So before we talk about New Hampshire education, mm -hmm. we want to talk about a little bit of nationally. Big thing on the news for the past week, week and a half, has been Minnesota. Mm -hmm. The collective, where the governor wants to strip the teachers of the collective bargaining. Can you explain to some of the viewers the difference between their collective bargaining and the collective bargaining in New Hampshire? Yeah. Um, and, and Madison, kind of the epicenter of all this conversation, uh, uh, where most of this sort of has emerged on the national level, and it's uh, Iowa now and Indiana are having some of the conversation. In New Hampshire, uh, in our area, we have 14 collective bargaining agreements. Uh, so when we sit down and look at a contract, we could be working with any one of that 14 different groups. Um, what happens, you know, they will have representatives that will sit down with uh, members of the board and typically uh, somebody from administration and will begin to look at issues that are of interest to both parties. Uh, eventually, of course, they craft an agreement, but that agreement then has to be voted on by the board and has to be voted on by the association. So both groups have to agree that this is something they want to bring forward. Then when they do that, it has to go to the public hearing. So the people have the total opportunity to hear and ask questions relative to the nature of the various agreement. Once it gets through that stage, it has to be voted on either at the district meeting or in, in Keene at the ballot. So it has to be approved by the electorate in order to be moved forward. And typically, these agreements will go two to four years um, and will have kind of graduated uh, steps. Um, and that's been the tradition of our area. But certainly, unlike many states where the vast majority of the funding for local education comes from the state, in Keene, I believe, we're about 17 percent from the state of New Hampshire. So in our case, the, really the local electorate does get involved and has the opportunity, and they've exercised that opportunity in many occasions since I've been in Keene, um, to turn down an agreement and send people back. Um, we currently have two agreements uh, that will be voted on next Tuesday. Uh, both have been favorably approached. I've seen very little really issue relative to the agreements. Uh, you know, there's some concessions in health care, very modest, I think 1.6% percent raise. Um, and then when you start fashioning in the, the health care uh, contributions, there's really very little uh, to argue about in these two agreements. So I don't anticipate the teacher agreement or the agreement with the paraprofessionals to run into much resistance next Tuesday. I think they're pretty responsible. I think both parties uh, understood the economy and the, and the issues that are before them and, and tried to fashion an agreement that represented that reality. And in, in some states, teacher funding 
teacher employment is at the state level. Right. And so <clears throat> I could be a teacher in Keene making $45,000 a year, and I could be a te teacher in a really expensive um, area and making forty five, dollars and it doesn't always work out. Yeah, in New Hampshire, obviously, <laughs> we're... We are local control. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're very, very few states now that have kind of a district meeting where they don't have an autonomous school board, but whereas the electorate can get right in the middle at any point in the process and say, here's how, you know, it's going to be. So I think we've looked in New Hampshire at a statewide salary for teachers. Uh, I really don't think it, it received traction in any way, shape, or form from, from uh, the majority of people in our region. Um, you know, I think it makes sense to look at individual issues, to set individual district goals, and kind of develop a salary schedule and compensation package that meets those issues. And because of the New Hampshire local control, and because the school board doesn't report to the, the mayor, like in some cities in New Hampshire, the mayor says, just cut 15% off the school board, and that's all the school board has to work with. They have to do all the hard stuff. Or like in Providence, Rhode Island, the mayor just said, send layoff notice to 2,000 employees, and we'll decide at the end of the year, after our budget, whether we want to, if we have money for them. But don't you, you risk losing some really quality teachers? Because they can go, area districts want quality teachers. And that's kind of the irony uh, when you really look at it, because it's become more and more <laughs> apparent that the value in, in student learning is in the at the classroom teacher level. A good teacher will make a one and a half year difference. An average student coming into the classroom with a good teacher can expect to gain about a year and a half worth of additional learning. Con conversely, if you enter a teacher who's not very good, you can expect about a half a year of learning. So if you end up two years in a row, if you're unlucky enough to have a poor teacher, and you're grade level behind. As in the same time, if you end up with a great teacher for two years in a row, you're grade level ahead. Now, as far as the teacher that has the easiest time going to another district, it's usually not the poor teacher because their resume, their qualifications, their ability to interview in a way that's compelling is probably not as, a, as good as the great teacher that might have evidence of student learning, of student performance as a classroom. Those are the teachers that can if they feel like they're in jeopardy or if they suddenly feel like their security around future mm -hmm. job is being jeopardized, are much, much ab more able to move. So I think that is a very short-sighted view um, to, to just cut in, in, and then try to backfill depending on what your revenue looks like uh, down the road. There's got to be a, a better way to do it. Because yeah, when I was on a school board before, it seemed that like at least one every year, places like Hanover, who could pay their teachers a heck of a lot more. We'd go around and maybe cherry pick one of our best teachers because they can do more. <clears throat> and so that's the last thing you don't want. You don't want wealthy communities cherry picking the best teachers possible by saying fifteen to twenty thousand dollars more. Right. And yeah, <clears throat> we've been fortunate in our region, of course we have you know, between Keene State, the work that we have with Antioch, close uh, Franklin Pierce being close, uh, we've had a, a good supply of well, of qualified uh, teacher candidates that we've been able to work with through our through our system and through student teaching. We get to know many of these people. So when we finally select somebody, uh, we have both those that want to come into this community, as I did, because it's a beautiful place to, to live and to raise children, but also we have people that are very familiar with the schools, and at the same time, we're familiar with them. So I think we've been able to kind of really mold um, a positive and a very professional uh, cadre of teachers as a result, and we've been fortunate. And we certainly have other issues that we need to deal with, but having a good supply of uh, dynamic, uh, effective teachers hasn't been one of our issues. Well, nationwide, everybody's talking, we got to cut, cut, cut. We had Texas, excuse <coughs> me, who thought they had a surplus, found out they had a deficit, so the governor says, just cut $5 billion from education. Different other states just cut without looking at any of the, the ramifications. <clears throat> what kind of signal do you think it's sending to, to parents, to, to teachers? Why would people want to come into the teaching profession if it can be just sliced off like that? I mean, I, I don't want to complain yes. because we're very fortunate uh, in public yeah. education in our region uh, is, is, I think, much better than in most areas mm -hmm. in the state and in the country. 
But I will say that right now, uh, it feels to many educators that, that they are under attack. Um, and certainly, things have changed. Our global competitiveness uh, has been compromised. We need to do some things. We need to add more time in the school day. We need probably to add more days with students. We need to ramp up expectations around something like the Common Core. I mean, there are, we have some charges, and we need to take them seriously and go for it. But at the same time, understand that our students are in a, a dynamic environment where their ability to compete and as a consequence, our ability to thrive as a nation is much more in jeopardy than ever. We need our best teachers. We need a system where everybody is working together. Now is not the time to throw you know, rocks at each other. But whereas we need to roll up our sleeves and get the best possible outcome we can for our students, they're going to need that. And you can go right down the list, you know, Bill Gates on down. They understand that our ability to maintain our competitive advantage is strictly based on our ability to continue to educate students in a way that will build that capacity. We're bringing in well, 50% of our PhDs in, um, in chemistry last year were foreign, foreign nationals. We are bringing in, and you, you go to like Silicon Valley where they're bringing in people from all over, you know, India and yeah. China. We're not quite meeting that expectation, especially in math and science. So we need to do that, and we can do that here, but we need a cooperative effort. If you look around, you know, at New Hampshire, in one way we're fortunate, given that so little of our funding comes from the state. If the state cuts 10%, that isn't quite the impact that it might have in places where 80 or even 90% of the funding might come from the state. So we're able to manage it locally. The problem is that with our property tax structure, those communities that have a diff more difficult time raising taxes because they, are, they have a lower property evaluation per student are really stuck in a time of economic downturn. Uh, there are other communities, let's say, that have $10 million of property evaluation per student. Keene's probably around 700000 So you can see how much easier it would be if you had that kind of property evaluation to raise enough money to build a new gym, to build a new school. You're not to, picking on our own superintendent, are you? <laughs> I'm not picking on anybody. I understand yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, that there are various groups and <laughs> winners and losers. But yeah. I contend that it's a little like uh, if you, you have five wards in Keene. If you were to say, base Keene City mm. Government, we're going to charge Ward 1, 2, and 3 this rate, okay. Wards 4 and 5 this rate, you know, people would be a little incensed. Or if you were to say, our military you know, ex uh, budget this year, we're going to charge these states a higher Everybody. percentage of income than... I mean, obviously, when there's a responsibility mm -hmm. of, of the state to educate and provide an adequate education... Um, there is a responsibility to fund that level of adequate education in a fair and equitable way. And, con and currently, uh, in, it depends on what street you live on, <laughs> it depends on what ward you live on or live in, uh, rather than a, a state obligation being funded through a state revenue. And that's the conversation we're having in Concord. And unfortunately, right now, if you have, let's say, you have five wards in New Hampshire, three wards, are, are, there's a bit of work to, to build a consensus to come up with three in order to manage your own, to keep your own costs down, rather than to look at what indeed has been established in the Constitution, has been fought through Claremont and Londonderry within 10 years, twice. And it, it's really obvious it's a state-funded responsibility. But somehow... Uh, people are kind of talking around that in order, in some cases, to protect what they consider to be an unjust tax in their community. The, um, <clears throat> when we go into adequate education, <clears throat> four years ago when I was up at Concord, <clears throat> we had the constitutional amendment because they wanted to be able to define adequate, ad adequate education. They couldn't get the constitutional amendment passed because when you sat down and looked at it, a lot of communities were going to suffer. So they get around it by saying, hey, I'm going to define what an educa ed adequate education is, and I'm going to tell you how much it costs. Then we came up with that great $3,400. And now we have some people who are saying $3,400 is too much for an adequate education. I saw one figure down about $2,800. Yeah. <clears throat> what would something like that do to SAU 29? Well, obviously, the three thousand four hundred and fifty dollars, which is about is less than a third of the statewide average of the cost, so it's it's not like we're getting a lot of money. Um, as and if you look at 
um, how they determine that money. They raise much of it through local property taxes, send it to the state of New Hampshire, and then send it back. Or in some cases, they save the cost of the transferring of funds and just say, leave it right here. The problem, of course, is that there are about 45 communities under the new uh, law at 3,450 that would have to send more to the state than they actually receive, which is what you would expect yeah. if, with a statewide revenue system. Yeah. But those communities have created um, a kind of a rally cry around, we don't want to be a donor town. And that suggests, or I think there's a connotation, that they're giving money to people who don't deserve it that they've earned and you know, raised in their local community. And, and it moves the conversation away from a statewide revenue issue. So you know, that's, that's a huge problem for, for Keene. Because if you look at Keene, uh, prior to the Claremont, we received $4 million the year before Claremont from, of state revenue. Which, if you, at that point, New Hampshire was last in the country uh, in the amount of state revenue they provided to public education as a, as a percent of a student and as a percent of income. And if, you tri- happy. <laughs> and if you tripled it, we still would have been last. We were dead 50th at about $7 or 7%. So Claremont came in and said, just a minute, in your constitution, you say that you will provide an adequate education. It's a fundamental right, which you establish. Not only is it a fundamental right, but it's a compulsory fundamental right that every student, at least through 16, and now we've added two years to 18, has to be provided a free public education. So... Our, the framers of the Constitution understood that if we, our economy, if our nation was going to thrive, it was important that the state take this on. The federal government passed it on to the states, unlike most places in the world where it's at the national level. The states have that obligation to provide that adequate education and to do it in an equitable way. Well, Claremont, after looking at the obvious, that we were very much the last, and 35 states had already had this kind of conversation, realized that we had to come up with a... And so they charged uh, us to fund an adequate education. Well, seven, eight years later, in 2006, Londonderry, a town much like Keene as far as uh, revenue, um, said, hey, it's, now you've, you've gone from Keene, we had $4 million, went to Claremont. year after, we received $15 million. We received $15 million for two or three years. Then we started going back as the legislature had competing interests and it became difficult. And they kept chiseling away until we lost about a third of that money. Then Londonderry shows up and says, okay, you know, obviously, you're thumbing your nose at the state Supreme Court. Uh, you have to provide an adequate education. State Supreme Court looks at it and says, okay, you didn't do it the first time. Now I want you to, they didn't say, here's what you do. But they said, define an adequate education. Then you have to figure out a way to pay for the adequate and pay for it. And then make sure that you, there's some accountability so that you know that that, and the people in your state know that you're getting the adequate education that you promised that, you're, that you've defined. So they went to work, starting with the House Committee on Education, and they decided to look at one iota above inadequate, That's and right. that became their standard. Basically, they took all the minimum standards. They, did it, they ramped it up a little bit uh, in that they took, let's say you, had, you, had, you get paid for one teacher for every 30 third graders. That teacher, under the current law, would, could have three years of experience, a, B, a bachelor's and three years. The new law that you're talking about that would go to 2800 would drop that down to an entry-level teacher. So you get paid for one. So they basically, they're, they're trying to look at the margins in a few places where they were a one iota above inadequate. And they're trying to carve that down in order to get down to 2800 And I understand it's a huge issue because the revenue that it would take to get to the 3400 is about $200 million. And right now, you and I know that is probably... They're probably not, not going to find it. So that's, that's a real issue for us. But at the same time, they've come up with these packages where they're kind of saying, listen, we'll hold everyone harmless for two years if you buy this package, <laughs> which will lessen a- adequacy down the road. Well, I would suggest as a keen voter, and I'm a keen voter yeah. and a keen taxpayer, that go back to 1997, prior to the time yeah. when the court was involved. Now, the legislature can always add more to yeah. poor communities, so that's an ar- argument that really has no weight. But what we know about the difficulty in providing, in coming up with the revenue, if we go every two years and the legislature says, here's what I think public education in New Hampshire deserves, the chances are that it will get to that $3,450, in my opinion, is pretty remote, based on past practice, based on the Revenue issues that we have in the state. I mean, there's some wonderful. New Hampshire has done some great things. 
and, and it's a great place to live. But I think as a public educator, and as, when looking ahead, um, we really need to hold on to that uh, Constitution and, and that place in the Constitution where an adequate education is, def or is expected. And what will happen, uh, I believe this time, the legislature will come up with a 60, the 60 percent vote to put it on as a referendum in November. And at that point, uh, the population of New Hampshire will have to decide, do they want, um, a con do they want in their constitution the expectation that the state will educate or provide an adequate education, or do they want to pull it out and allow the legislature every two years to determine what that will take? Unfortunately, in New Hampshire, we are mo more and more of our households are, are without We're children. Getting older. Uh, we're about 21% right now of the households in New Hampshire that have children, and that number is going down. We're, we're, those over 65, that number is going up. So it's a greater burden to convince people, many of them from out of the state, that indeed uh, a quality education in New Hampshire is, is important to our future as, as citizens of New Hampshire and to the greater good in, in the United States. And that's something that we've got to continue to remind people because they were provided a quality education, or hopefully they were, uh, and I think they understand that this isn't something that we can pull back very far, especially now, uh, in a time of greater competitiveness than ever. This is a time when we need to find that 3,450, or as close as we can, to at least maintain that kind of sa security blanket for, for our students. Because if you know as well as if we go back, we're never coming forward again. We have people up in... For example, you talked about the Common Core standards. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're rougher, but I'm pretty comfortable and confident that the American kids can make those. Mm -hmm. But we have people in New Hampshire who want to pass the law, not allowing any community to accept those standards. You know, they implemented the Common Core so that we could transfer students from state to state, and those students wouldn't be disadvantaged. In the military, for example, there's one million military students that transfer on average six to nine times to different states. Yeah. Every time they land in a different state, they land with different expectations, different standards, and as a consequence, those students are continually disadvantaged. The colleges that get students from different states are in re spending more money on remediation than ever. That's a huge issue. Our textbook or our program uh, originators are trying to match their textbooks and their programs with the, the curriculum from 50 different states. Right now, there's about 43 states signed on with Common Core. This is a great thing for New Hampshire, a great thing for the country. And one thing that will emerge through our testing of the Common Core, which will likely happen in 2014, is that New Hampshire has a pretty solid um, population, uh, educated population, and, and will do relatively well. And that will become an additional way in which we can attract uh, quality business uh, to our state. I think many businesses now are finding communities and finding states uh, to, to begin business with the, uh, in that have that quality education system that's becoming more and more a priority for them. And if we can demonstrate in New Hampshire that indeed, you know, if there are 44, 45, 50 states that are using Common Core and we're all being assessed on the Common Core and we're in the top two or three states as we typically might be with the SAT, uh, that's going to be a big help. Uh, to New Hampshire. But more importantly, it's a big help for students to have clear expectations. We need to ramp them up in literature. It's more about nonfiction. It, it ramps things down. More about math facts and math. There's a real expectation that, we're, that those core values and core curriculum areas are going to be mastered through this Common Core conversation. So if we pull back, um, we're, we're stepping back, and that would be a big mistake. We, need, we take the Common Core, and we go back to what you said earlier about <coughs> school length. When, when I was in Okinawa, the, the Japanese kids went to school an average of 240 days a year. Five days a week, half a day on Saturday, and they just had um, <clears throat> August off. And when we looked at the numbers, high school graduate in Japan spent four more years in the classroom than the American student. So with the Common Core, the Common Core doesn't mean <clears throat> that's the only structure you're going to educate the kids in. So if we expand the day some so you can still do the Common Core and then the local community with local control can decide what extra they want to. If they want to teach New Hampshire history right. or Florida history, they can do that. Right. Yeah, I, I, we have to offer, the, offer those opportunities for our students. It's really not fair to uh, train, let's say that we're training for a race. And we're training, you know, four days a week, two hours. And the people that we're training against are training 
six days a week for eight hours. And uh, we're surprised, you know, that we're not quite uh, getting to the finish line at the same time. I mean, there are other mm -hmm. things that we can do. We may be able to not match them year yeah. for, day for day. Yeah. There, there's some things that we might be able to do that, that are more intelligent um, and, and yet give the student an opportunity to, to be in more kinds of extra activities and more home life. But we definitely are not there. We need more time uh, with our students during the school day or we need to lengthen our year. That needs to be a real conscious debate um, where communities begin to take a look at what the advantages and disadvantages of maintaining the 180-day agrarian school year calendar and moving forward and uh, embracing something uh, where our students are, have a, a little better playing field as far as fairness goes. And currently they don't. Because when I lived in California, California had year-round school. You had, you had to go three quarters. And if there was space available or you wanted to have your child take extra stuff, they could go to the fourth quarter. And so some of the kids who are behind, so instead of holding back a child for a year, you can go and say, well, Timmy is behind in English. So let's have Timmy come an extra nine weeks for that English class, and then he can move on with the rest of his group. That's a different way of looking at it. Good. Some other communities are now saying, well, yeah, <clears throat> you can do your four hours or your four classes, but you know what? If you want to be proactive, we'll let you take virtual high school, or you can take some classes at home or the local college to add on to your, your transcript to make the children more competitive. Yeah. And, and I think those are the kinds of uh, creative solutions that we can come up with. But right now, we're not serious relative to that debate. Um, we're, we, you know, we seem to be distracted by other things. But I think we really need to focus on student achievement. What will help our students meet their competitive, make that competitive advantage that they'll need in their future? It's not just in their best interest. It's in the country's best interest. It's in the interest of our future. I just don't think we want to just fall back and, and uh, watch other nations move ahead because it's really about the brain power now. It's not, it's not, we've been blessed with great natural resources. You know, you and I have been around, <laughs> we've seen it. Uh, and we're very fortunate. Uh, this is the a perfect latitude, perfect, I mean, the climate here, the, the ability to build this infrastructure, the democracy that helped encourage all of that to happen. And we're now in a place where the human capital around ability to problem solve, to create, to work together, um, is the future relative to that competitive, uh, national competitive link. And, and that has to be the focus of our attention. Saturday I was reading the magazine from the Hoover Institution, and it says, <clears throat> in the early 1800s and late night, the United States was the breadbasket of the world. Then United, in the 19th century, 20th century, the United States became the marketplace of the world, but now the United States has become the graduate school of the world, right. where, like you said earlier, top-notch students come to the United States, get their graduate degree, get their PhDs, then they go back home and compete against us. So we're not training our children, the mathematic mathematicians, the chemists, and all these. Mm -hmm. We're training them to go back to beat us. Yeah. In China this last year, the College Board allowed the a AP courses to be offered in Chinese public schools. So now those students are coming over to the U.S. with courses already and credits that they already can take into our U.S. colleges. I mean, that's been a great, great thing for China. I, I misspoke. I, I mentioned that it was 50 percent of uh, chemistry PhDs. I'm not sure about that. It's 50 percent of engineering PhDs. Engineers. I am sure about that. Yeah. China and India are really big on engineering. Right. And they're, they're coming here. They're getting that great education from our, I mean, our colleges are wonderful and, and people around the world understand that. They're getting that education and going back and, and enriching the lives of those communities, which is great. But my contention is that if we have a student who wants to be, uh, in, wants to get a PhD in engineering, and, and they're unable to match the level of assessment because we have not provided them with the opportunity that they have in India or China. Given our resources, I think we should be ashamed of ourselves. I mean, maybe the student chooses not to take it. That's one thing. But we need to provide that opportunity. And I think we misdirect a little when we don't make certain that our students know that we feel that the education that they're going after when they face the first day in you know, September 1st and, and look at that teacher. They need to know that that is 
such important FaceTime, that that experience at the seat is the most important part of their day. And in China and India, the parents have made Mate. sure, and the government and the communities have made sure that the students know that. In the United States, I'm not sure that we have. I think we still have kind of a little of the old Greece mentality, you'll call the musical <laughs> Greece, yeah. you know, that it's, it's more about what happens in the fast car after mm-hmm. school and... and that all is wonderful, you know. The Glee world of, and, and I, you know, I'm, I'm in dramatics. I did, uh, you know, I was in production and, and coach drama, and um, you know, in high school, and, and some of those kinds of things. I believe in that, and I believe in music, and I'm a big proponent of art, um, and I think all that has to happen. But it needs to happen in a way in which students understand that as they move forward, there is a real expectation of their own responsibility. If they have a gap, they need to fill it. And they need to make sure that they'll be ready when they graduate from high school to do what they to make sure their dreams can become a reality. Because I do think we have too many of our students that are going to remedial uh, coursework. About twenty five you know, percent of college students is now um, remedial. Yeah, and that's just not right. And I'd be really upset if I sent my son or daughter to a college and spent thirty thousand dollars to learn what they should have learned in high school. Absolutely. <clears throat> the um, my fear about public education is it's going to go back to like it was in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s. Basically, you just educated the people to fill the jobs in the local community. If you were in Winchester and it was a tannery, you went to eighth grade and then you went to work with your father. Manchester for the women. <clears throat> and, and I think what most people don't understand, the GI Bill, while it helped some people to go to college, the biggest thing the GI Bill did was to allow a lot of men to get not only technical, training, but for them to get their high school diplomas, because most of them never had. And with that <clears throat> intellectual capital that we built up, we had about 40 to 50 years where we had no competitors whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like the Boston Celtics or the New York Yankees. When you don't have any competition, right. you tend to fall back, and before you realize that your competitors are way ahead of you and I don't think we've developed a competitive education no and and we were fortunate after World War II obviously we had the infrastructure in place I mean like 75 (laughs) percent of appliances worldwide in the late 50s we were producing most of the televisions most of the automobiles I mean it was a great time Um, that's all changed and the, the, what, it's not muscle that's the building automobiles and appliances today. It's computer systems. It's the robotic type environment that takes a real complex group of people, you know, thinking about how to solve problems. And we're fortunate in this region. We do have some businesses that are doing that kind of thing. And I think they are providing jobs for our young people. I think our Cheshire Center is taking advantage of that. But to be able to predict when you look at a ninth grader or a tenth grader in the eyes and wonder what, you know, be, as you could have in Manchester or Hinsdale, so this is likely where the student's going, you don't know. Because most of the jobs haven't been created yet. What you will do know that they'll need to read well to compute, compute. They need to be able to problem solve. They need to be creative thinkers. They need to be charged and excited about sitting down with a group of people and finding a way to solve very complex problems. Those, we know that th- that skill set will be uh, in- invaluable for those students. So we need to continue to focus and refocus on that so that we're reading more complex material where our writing becomes deeper and, and, and engaged in, in, in uh, nonfiction uh, material, and we graduate students who are really ready for this global economy. There was, uh, I think it was about six weeks ago in the Keene Sentinel, there was, I can't remember the book, there was an article about the author who tracked about 2,500 students. And he was talking <clears throat> about 40% of some um, disciplines, I'm not going to say which ones, mm-hmm. <clears throat> had not, did not have the necessary reading and writing and the ability to think critical. And they were high, high school, I mean, college graduates. Some of them were from Ivy League schools and some of them were poor. It went all the way up. In a lot of ways, it was like the degrees mentality mm-hmm. Here it is, I pay my tuition, I just grease it right along, I get a diploma, and the world's going to be open up for me. Mm-hmm. There's an awful lot of 25 and 27-year-olds are living home with mom and dad, and mom and dad spent maybe a quarter of a million dollars, and they expect it differently. I just saw an interesting clip uh, on, uh, on YouTube from the Annenberg Foundation. Uh, they interviewed some Harvard graduates. This was either <laughs> last spring or the spring before. 
and they asked uh, asked the Harvard graduates and looked around. There's great, uh, you know, trees in the Harvard Yard area. And you know, how do the trees gain the mass? You know, the weight uh, that they have. And one person would say, well, it's the water. Another one would say the soil. And then one would say minerals. And no one of all these folks that they interviewed, and I hope they were, you know, it was a good sample, but nobody said it was the carbon bonding that created the mass and the weight. And the, the principle or the issue was that we don't have that core curriculum that someone in the, maybe the 19 industrialized countries that we compete the most with have. And as a consequence, we're not sure what exact, you know, the core knowledge that our students have. It's another argument for the Common Core, to, to not to throw the Common Core. It may not be perfect, but it is a bigger challenge than what we currently have. It, we've already started to work with it in SAU 29. We've tried to match it up with our current uh, state uh, core that we're assessed with NECAP. Um, and it really matches up pretty well. It's true we have to ramp some things up, but we don't believe that's a harm uh, to, for students to go beyond where they're currently at or expected to be at can't see that as a, as a harm. So I don't. I hope that New Hampshire will continue with Common Core, and when that hits, uh, uh, you know, the real crossover in April, and, and and people really get serious about it, that they leave it alone. Uh, it's it's good for New Hampshire, and it's good for those students who are going to places like Harvard. When you talk about the Common Core in the Marine Corps, you go 12 weeks to boot camp, and they have a three-day, what's called the Crucible. Mm -hmm. Every Marine has to pass it. And, and if you don't pass it, you go home. And some of the Army people go, wait a minute, that's such a waste of resources. Why would you have someone 12 weeks fail something for three days and send them home? Can't you just find another way? Well, but what the Crucible has done, any Marine that shows up at any place in the world, you already know they have made a certain standard. That would be the common core. Right. You know, without asking... Everyone is at a basic standard right. just by, by showing up. Right. And <clears throat> you, you don't know that nowadays. Right. You can't even do that with different communities around the state. Right. And it's not fair for our colleges, not fair for our military. I mean, it's obvious. Common Core isn't the only thing yeah. we'll ever yeah. teach. I mean, that's, that's right. that will just be something that we can say when a student moves to the fourth grade, we know they, they have this. this. They may, hopefully, we'll have, have more. much, much more. I mean, there's some great other parts of our program that we would never want to sacrifice for the Common Core, but we don't have to. But at the same time, we can ensure that our students have this basic building, and if they transfer from Wheelock to Franklin or from Chesterfield, you know, to Keene Middle School, it, it, it won't matter because they'll have at least that baseline, and the teachers that are looking at them building new lessons and new learning based on past learning will have that scaffolding already in place. So it will help moving forward as well as making sure that people understand what our students know. And the Common Core not only helps the student that's going from Chesterfield, for example, excuse me, to Keene, but it would also help the, um, the kids in Keene because if a couple of kids move in mm -hmm. and they're a year, year and a half behind, right. that's going to distract the, the teacher because he or she is going to have to do some extra work to help yeah. that child to catch up. When you think about the eight or nine schools coming into Keene High School and the various curriculum, you know, background that those students have had, uh, the Common Core will help make that more similar and will make it much, much easier for those ninth grade teachers, Keene High School, you know, to get their curriculum kind of moving and getting their students moving without going back and assessing where students are, are at. I, right now, we do a pretty good job, but we have, you know, we have schools, Winchester not part of our SAU, Stoddard's not part of our SAU. Surrey now, even though it's not part of our SAU, all their students are going through our system, so we're pretty close there. But there's still, I mean, there are over 200 students uh, in Winchester, and this will, the Common Core will help us uh, with them. Although they've been working well with us recently to help line up their curriculum. I think they've done and a they great made job. I think it was, I was on school board before, was it 2003, 2004? They've yeah. made tremendous... Um, Progress really have, and if you just want to be on the money side, they filled a lot of called Southwest Airline. They filled a lot of empty seats, and they saved the Keen taxpayers a lot of money and allow them to bring have extra courses. Right, yeah. but at the same time, when you're looking at the whole community, Keen is really giving the children from Winchester an opportunity to shine to right. to take advantage of something. Yeah. Right now, Keen actually gets more revenue from 
tuition from sending students than they do from the state. It's pretty close, but uh, it's over $10 million that they get from sending towns. And given that we've had a 16% decrease in uh, population uh, over the past 10 years, which is actually a little less than the towns, which had an 18% decrease. But given that we've had that decrease, we've been able to maintain the program that people really, you know, the diversity of program. Over 200 courses at Keene High School, for example. And many of those are, you know, like the AP, the real challenged uh, courses. When we brought Mandarin in, you start looking at the Cheshire Center, the kinds of, you know, great programs that we've had to help make certain that students are ready. We would have had to downscale that uh, significantly had we not had that additional revenue. So over $10 million annually, uh, you can imagine we can do a lot with that. And we have. In addition, when you look at Keene Middle School, we received 58%, or at least that's the promise, 58% of reimbursement um, because of the number of districts that are going to Keene Middle School. 40% would have been the baseline. So there's 18% of $38 million that were additional funds coming in. That's because $8 million of that. extra. Yeah. So... There have been some real advantages. Keene has opened their arms to, to towns, and um, hopefully it's been mutually beneficial. Certainly, I go around to a lot of towns, obviously, and I hear so many compliments about Keene High School right now. And everybody's excited about the new Keene Middle School and all of the opportunities there as well. So Keene has really been, uh, should, um, you know, be, be very proud of uh, what they are contributing to the region and hopefully understanding that these people are coming in and working in their communities and doing so much more. But when it comes to your ability to make adequate yearly progress in Keene High School, <laughs> consider that to be my ability as well, uh, that depends on about 50% of the population that are not really residents of Keene because you are getting close now to that 50% line. It's important that we have that regional expectation. That's another reason the Common Core works for our region and we don't want to give that up. And you talk about the um, No Child Left Behind. No Child Left Behind is coming up for reauthorization. The, <clears throat> my, my view on it, it had a lot of good goals. The funding wasn't there. And I'm afraid that a lot of people are going to go say, well, it's just about testing, and testing doesn't mean anything, so let's go back to the old way. But how do you go back to the old way and have common um, curriculum. Yeah, this is going to be interesting to play this out because obviously uh, Washington is running into the same economic uh, catastrophe that most states are. Uh, with the No Child Left Behind, um, you know, some of the things, that, it was definitely underfunded. $77 of revenue for $575 per student additional cost. So definitely underfunded. But it did help us focus on that free and reduced lunch group, uh, that socioeconomic disadvantaged population. And we discovered through a lot of research around this whole test, national test, um, that we can overcome uh, in the home environments where the economics are an issue. That there's no, we, can, we can do that. There are a number of examples of schools that have 90% of students on free and reduced lunch that are at 90% proficiency in reading and math. And we've looked at those, we've investigated, and we know it can be done. And that's been exciting because there had been an, uh, kind of a, a cultural expectation that at times, you know, poor neighborhoods, it was difficult to get those students up. It's now we know we can do it, and we've got a lot of strategy. So that emerged from No Child Left Behind. That was the best thing, in my opinion, that happened. The worst thing was that it focused on special ed population in a way that probably was um, <coughs> awkward and counterproductive. But other things that happened, um, the, the looking at lining up curriculum yep. and doing it in, in where we have a, an annual assessment. The new ESEA... Uh, if the blueprint for reform, which is what's being pressed as the new ESEA, which hopefully will be endorsed this session, has a growth model, which we've been excited about in SEU 29 for a long time. We've been pushing a growth model. We know, for example, that 59% of our students made a year's worth of growth in math last year and 58% in reading. We, we've been tracking that, and we, think, we know that that's the most democratic way to look at a student from where they are and say, where can they be at the end of the year and are we able to get them there with the help of the parents and, and with the teacher's knowledge and with strategies that we can make certain that our students are ready at the end of that year and we can look in the eye and say, we did our best to make sure that they got at least a year's worth of growth and hopefully 
uh, much more than that. So the new ESEA right now is challenging that growth model. There are two big $160 million grants that have been given to different testing companies that were, are supposed to come up with uh, assessment based on the Common Core that will include that growth model, and that's, that's extremely exciting exciting for us. You know, we're really happy about that. The other piece is it's going to be college and career ready, which means they are going K through 16, and the expectation is that the colleges will line up with 12th grade uh, and that there will be more of a seamless transition and that we'll be able to track our students that graduate from Kenai High School and go to college and find out where they are four years later if indeed they were able to manage the coursework as, as a freshman and sophomore. So that kind of seamless transition through public education in the United States, that's exciting. And I've, I've talked to uh, Dean Treadwell at Keene State College. We're doing a, a lot with some of that and, and some exciting things that we hope to have done with Race to the Top <coughs> funds that unfortunately we didn't get. But nevertheless, we're th- that, those two parts of the college and career ready, getting kids ready and then tracking them through college, is exciting, and the growth model instead of a, a proficiency where you know a teacher looks at, at their classroom and it's okay, we got 92 percent, and last year these same kids were 72 percent, and they have some students that they know are going to be proficient even if they don't put a whole you know as much effort into, and others that it just isn't a fair way to look at a, at a student. Rather, let's look at where they are right now. Let's take if they've come from you know maybe they transferred from uh, Tennessee or wherever. Yeah. And here now we have this student. Can we make certain that this student gets a year's worth of growth in reading and math by the end of the year? We're also testing in science and, and writing, but only every we span those. We don't test every year. When you, when you talk about the growth model, it also goes the other way, where you have some parents who say, "Well, Johnny's not going to go to school until he turns six, but Johnny was born in October, so Johnny now shows up in first grade, which is really a seventy. Oh, and if he's been home with mom, he may be three, four years ahead. Mm-hmm. But each year, he, he goes less than a year. So maybe by seventh or eighth grade, he may be at the level or behind the other kids you were talking about, the growth model. Right. You know, we, we have some issues with our legislature around that, too, in that there's two bills. One, that would eliminate uh, compulsory uh, attendance. So parents could decide, you know, I'm going to keep my kid home for a couple months or whatever. Um, and I hear I'm arguing for more days, and, and the legislature is saying, well, maybe the student doesn't need the 180 days under those circumstances. So that's, that's a problem, uh, you know, for me. And then there's some home ed issues that, I mean, I, and we have a, a lot of kids that are getting great education at, at home. And, um, but I'd, I'd like to have a little more oversight uh, relative to, you know, that small group that may be kind of falling, slipping through the cracks, and then we maybe we don't see them as first graders and fifth graders. They show up and, and you know, they have some real gaps, and, and then we're charged with kind of filling those gaps and making it all work. I would, and I think most parents that are doing home education and doing a great job don't mind a little bit of oversight from uh, the superintendent level. I'd like to see that kind of move forward, but right now I don't see that even getting close to having a, a conversation this session. And I know, you know, I'm, I'm probably making some people upset just to mention it. But I, I, in good conscience, I do think there are some kids that are slipping through the cracks. I know I've seen it. And most kids are getting great home education from conscientious parents that are doing a wonderful job. But there is that small group that's slipping through, and I would just feel a lot better. I'd sleep better if I knew that we were able to provide some oversight to say, you know, there, here's a student that needs something that maybe they're not getting. Um, so those are two areas where the legislature's kind of moving in a different direction than I'd like to see. Um, I'd like to see, you know, adding days to the year <laughs> calendar. My, my daughter's got a teacher certificate from Cal State Fullerton. Mm-hmm. She homeschools the three kids. Mm-hmm. And there's a bunch of women who, they're all women that <clears throat> don't want to be sexist. Mm-hmm. They're all teacher certified. Yeah. And as with all teachers, you're not good at everything. Mm-hmm. So they, they work and they switch. And, but they all have to use um, lesson plans that were approved by the state of Georgia. Yeah. And they all have to take a test every year. And if they're not staying with the grades, the state of Georgia can say, nope, Mr. and Mrs., you're not doing it. Yeah. It's a responsibility for the children to get an education. Yeah, in New Hampshire, you don't have to be a college grad. You basically... There's no s- test. There's, there's no test and say, 
you know what, we'll show up at your doorstep at ninth grade. There's no curriculum you have to <clears> There's no curriculum in yeah. what happens if the kid shows up in um, ninth grade and really only has a fourth grade education? Was then, it fair to the kid? Then, well, then you spend more money in remediation, um, you know, various services, title services, sometimes special ed services, but whatever, you know, we do what we can to bring, bring this case forward. We don't <coughs> say, oh, it's too bad. I just yeah. think uh, New Hampshire needs to think a little bit, just be just a little more realistic. That you know, there is the possibility that not everybody's getting the great home ed. It sounds like, you know, I, certainly in most states there is some oversight. And if if we had just part of that oversight, we have the, the most liberal home ed laws yeah. in the country. We just need some oversight to say, even if it's like some, every honest. two or three years, to have some kind yeah. of an assessment or some way to say, you know, this student indeed is keeping up. If for no other reason, so that we can suggest um, options for parents uh, to consider. So I'd like to think that we're partners with all of our students in our region, not just those in our public schools. But I totally understand, uh, you know, parents don't want, you know, some of them don't want school officials engaged in their lives. And, I, you know, that's their right. I just would like to have the legislature think once again that uh, just to make sure that we all sleep at night, that there isn't that kid who would love to have a quality education and maybe, for whatever reason, their home ed program is not working. The, um, we'll go back to, in the beginning, we've got a few minutes left. <clears throat> from, co- coming from Montana, yeah. I'm on the municipality and county um, board at the com- um, committee up at the state house. And um, we've had a few people, a few bills, that want to do away with workforce housing. And they've got this perception that workforce housing is just poor, low-income, welfare people. <clears throat> We had a couple of people from the Chamber of Commerce, Nashua and uh, Manchester. Mm-hmm. And I go, I asked them, I says, isn't the three things that people, because I kept saying is, people graduate of high school and college, they leave, but when it comes time to raise their kids, they want to come back to New Hampshire. Right. And I go, isn't the three things they're looking for is affordable housing, quality schools, and safety? Right. And so <clears throat> that's what I was hearing before. One of the toughest problems keeping new teachers in Keene was they just couldn't afford to, to buy a house in Keene. It, w- it was so expensive. And so workforce housing in some communities are between 40, for people making forty to $50,000. That would do wonders for some of the people that would like to teach in Keene. Well, I, I think New Hampshire <laughs> needs to recognize that it is about jobs in regards to long-term keeping, sustaining the kind of economy and culture that that we want i mean you know sometimes it's the volunteer people in your community but you you want that cross section and you in order to build jobs you you do need housing that's affordable uh, most and, and you look at what's happening in Keene, i mean it's very difficult for some of our young families uh to buy a home and i know that you know this some of the requirements are more difficult than they were a few years ago and some of that's probably very good yeah. but somehow if there's a way that we can help these families find uh, affordable housing, so uh, to build our workforce capacity, because I do think we, we, you know, it's not like we have to change our, our, our the, and we don't have to rezone everything, and we don't, but we do need to look and, and say, what do we want our state to look like in 10 or 20 or 30 years? Do we want to become, you know, the retirement uh, mecca of of the, the Northeast or of the East Coast? I mean, do we want to, and, and we, you know, with only eight point. We are the lowest as a percent of income being taxed yeah. uh, in the country. Eight point seven percent. Ten point nine is national average. Do we want that to be the only thing that we offer, or do we want to have that intermixed with some affordable, uh, with jobs and affordable housing, um, so that there's that mix that we currently have? Because we're definitely moving in one direction, and I think most people in our state would prefer to keep it as it is or get back a little bit. Yeah, because <clears throat> we'll end this up. But the, the part is when I look at the state house, we look at New Hampshire, no sales tax, no income tax, no death tax. And we're having people moving into New Hampshire, no children, no grandchildren, saying, I don't want to pay taxes. I don't want to pay the school. And in a lot of ways, they're wiping out the New Hampshire culture. A kid wants to graduate from Keene Heights, get a job as a plumber. He or she can't afford the living team, has to go out of state. I don't think that's what we want. No, and I agree, and I think most of the people in New Hampshire do as well. I just hope I don't know if they've all thought about it, but I see us moving in in one direction, and I don't think we want to. I want to thank you, and we did a a lot of great discussions. Thank you very much for inviting me. No problem at all. 
We didn't cover everything we wanted to do, but so it's the end, and I will see you out there on the long road.